early, which we'll hope to bank for later use. I'm, I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you, most of you back, all of you, uh, to the Peterson Institute for International Economics for today's conference on the policy implications of sustained low productivity growth. I think this is actually a groundbreaking topic um, you know, because for good reason, in the US and in the OECD, there's been a lot of effort over the last several years to understand the productivity growth slowdown. It is not a unique phenomenon to the US, to the UK, to Japan. It is wide across the Western world. And when we think of it that way and when it persists, it becomes harder to dismiss some of the more secular or exogenous explanations that it's not just a crisis overhang. Now, of course, there has been a lively debate about the sources or causes of the productivity growth slowdown. And um, we are, in a sense, asking people to be small c Catholic or open-minded about that today. What we are moving on and why I think this is an important conference and an important project that we have undertaken and we're grateful for our many contributing authors is because it's like the rain. Everybody complains about it. Nobody does anything about it. Um, so we have a world in which people have been fighting over the productivity growth problems and we all kind of know it's bad and we can write down a very simple macro model and say, okay, this component is down. What happens? But we know, not least from the financial crisis, but from the real world, that what really matters is how an economic shock plays out through the specific policies and institutions that different countries have, including the US. That it's not just about, OK, growth goes down, maybe labor share goes down. It's about when, when this shock is felt, what actually transpires over the long term be it in healthcare financing, be it in pensions, be it in monetary policy effectiveness, be it in trade patterns. These are subtle but enormously important effects. And from a selfish point of view of the Institute, but perhaps importantly for the rest of the world, uh, people haven't been talking about that very much. And so what we've done is try to put together a great set, both internal and external authors, of scholars in the policy space with real research chops to go through in these various policy areas what really will happen if productivity growth stays low. Now, this event, I have three thank yous to make. One is to CompNet, which is providing us two of their scholars and a brilliant paper on the, some of the international aspects from micro to macro in trade. And CompNet is a network of European academics. Um, and we're very grateful to them for allowing us to broaden out this conference. But with no disrespect to them, I have two other much larger thank yous. Um, the first is to Robert Ziff and the Ziff, Robert Ziff Foundation. Robert, as um, many of you know, many more of you don't, and I'm not going to embarrass him by going on at length but is an active contributor to the public debate in the US on many issues. And he has been a engaged partner and supporter with the Pierce Institute for the last few years. And he and I have been having an ongoing conversation. And to Robert's credit, many years ago, he said, take seriously the productivity slowdown as something that will last. And he said a lot more than that. But he made that point. And took me longer than I probably should have, but still faster than some other people to realize I think he was right. And so coming from those conversations with Robert, and then obviously much more than that, um, we have come to this project. And the important thing is also like the rain. You know, we got a couple quarters of decent productivity data, or at least slightly improved productivity data in the US. If it turns out by virtue of having this conference, we reverse the productivity decline, <laughs> all in favor. You know, just like you bring an umbrella, it stops raining, right? But joking aside, I, I fear that's not the case. And whether or not it is the case in the US in the short term, it's still very 
daunting, the extent of the productivity slowdown across countries, the size, the persistence. And we have to think this through. We don't want to be caught unaware like in the 1970s when suddenly productivity slowed down and nobody knew what to do about it. Um, the second very large thank you goes to my colleague, the main organizer of this project, not just this conference, Jeremy Zettelmeyer. Jeremy has been with us, I think, just over a year after distinguished service in a number of institutions, including the German Economics Ministry, the EBRD, the IMF, and also a great scholar. It's been a pleasure to work with Jeremy on this project, and without him, we would not have the stellar cast or the high quality of papers we have today. So thank you for that, Jeremy. Um, one final remark before we turn to the substance in more depth. What Jeremy and I did was put a little more meat on this idea of a productivity slowdown. We sent around to all the authors and discussants starting months ago a sort of template, not of the papers, but of saying, okay, here's the baseline assumptions you should broadly work with. How bad a productivity slowdown are we talking about? How long? What should we do? And so we asked, we set out a baseline scenario, which is essentially continuation of the last five years average of productivity growth. And in this audience, it may not bear repeating, but it's worth remembering just how low that is. That would mean 1.2% annual TFP growth for Japan, for US, 1.0 annual TFP growth for the EU, 0.7% annual TFP growth for the UK, and probably less and 0.6% annual TFP growth for Japan. These are pretty grim numbers, and they are also much less than most official sector projections or most financial market projections have taken into account, at least until recently. We also encouraged our authors to consider a downside scenario where it's not just the average of the last several years, but the average of the last few years which is essentially a half a percent lower productivity growth in each of the major economies going forward for 10 plus years. And so it's not everybody put this in their machine and turned the crank, but to give you an idea of both the reality, because 0.7, for example, for the US annualized TFP growth is not outrageously low compared to recent numbers. It's outrageously low compared to 15 or 20 years ago. But we have to take it through. And so this is a very real world exercise, our authors taking this through. And there are a lot of counterintuitive results. Not everything becomes immediately bleak. Uh, for example, there was a great write up by our friend Greg Ipp in today's Wall Street Journal. Some of you may have seen about the paper by Anna Stansberry and co-authors um, on wages and productivity growth. If he doesn't show up for the meeting, you'll get named. Um, <laughs> um, the counterintuitive result, which is one of these classic good news, bad news results, and you'll see the paper in a few hours, is that the connection between real wage growth and productivity, at least in the US and in some other places, has not broken down as much as some people assert. Workers are getting their, I don't want to use the word fair, but in the sense their traditional share, statistically, of productivity growth, according to Stansbury and Summers. On the other hand, that tells you that if we are going to have this period of extended productivity growth slowdown, real wages ain't going anywhere. It's not like we can suddenly say, oh, let's just get the, the wage adjustment back to the way it was. It'll come through. Our colleagues, Karen Dynan, Louise Shiner, Neil Mahatra, have very interesting results thinking through the fiscal implications because these productivity growth changes, there's the obvious idea that, okay, we may have less revenue going forward, but there are a lot of very interesting feedback loops that people have not thought through and that our authors will be taking you through. Also, Axel borsch supan is giving us, along with our colleagues from CompNet, a very important international perspective on pension systems cross-nationally, where a lot of the action then becomes in the policy sphere, what is the right design of a pension system in a world where you not only have a demographic slowdown, but potentially persistent low productivity growth? So I am genuinely very excited, and I'm not going to go through every paper, even though we're delayed to have our colleague Jason Furman back, for example, to get, talk about some of the other intricacies of competition and inequality in a low productivity world. But I'm very excited we took on this project. As I said, if it turns out 
as our colleague Olivia Blanchard occasionally reminds us, productivity seems to be a random walk at decade intervals. If it turns out we wake up tomorrow and it's a sunny day in November, we'll be very happy. But I think the reality is it's going to be a long winter. And it's better that we have our intellectual coat to get us through it. And for that, I thank my colleagues. So let us turn to the first topic on public debt and taxation. And Bill Klein, longtime senior fellow here at the Institute, will moderate the session. Our first paper will be by Neil Mehotra, who's an assistant professor of economics uh, at Brown University. Uh, he was also a research economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, he received his PhD in economics from Columbia University. Uh, he will be followed by Karen Dynan, non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. She is a professor of practice at the Department of Economics at Harvard. Uh, served as Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and the Chief Economist at the Department of Treasury from 2014 to 2017. And from 2009 to 2013, she was Vice President and Co-Director of Economic Studies at Brookings. And our discussant will be Elena Dugar with Moody's Group Credit Officer for Sovereign Risk, where she covers global sovereign ratings. She was previously an economist at the International Monetary Fund and has a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. So Neil, we will start with you. All right, uh, thanks, thanks very much to the organizers for, uh, uh, for having me. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very interesting getting to, uh, to think about this topic. So two, uh, Two sort of trends stand out coming out of the Great Recession uh, when we think about sort of debt sustainability. First of all, there's been a massive increase or a fairly sizable increase in the debt to GDP ratio for, uh, for many OECD countries. So what, we're, what I'm showing you here on the left-hand side is the debt to GDP ratio for the OECD 20. And the median level of debt has risen in the last decade from 45% of GDP to 81% of GDP in 2015. And for many of these countries, there's been uh, a tripling of debt for the US and the UK. There's been a tripling of the debt to GDP ratio. For Japan, that ratio has doubled to uh, nearly 200% of GDP. And over the same period, you've seen a decline in productivity growth, which, we've, uh, which of course, this conference is, uh, is, is centered on. So what I'm showing on the right-hand side is labor productivity growth. Uh, the blue lines there are the uh, labor producti productivity growth from the 1990s. The gray lines are uh, since the Great Recession. And over this period, roughly, labor productivity growth has fallen from 1.9% to 0.9%. Uh, it's roughly fallen in half. And there's a great deal of heterogeneity across economies. Some economies have experienced a much sharper decline in, in labor productivity growth. Here I'm measuring labor productivity as output per hour. Uh, but if you looked at broader measures of, of productivity growth, like uh, total factor productivity growth, you would see roughly the same thing, uh, 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 a decline in half in, uh, in productivity growth. So on its face, these two trends or these two, these two facts would seem to bode uh, fairly poorly for debt sustainability. But there's a third factor that we need to think about. And the third factor we need to think about is the behavior of real interest rates. So when we think about debt sustainability, we typically think of a metric R minus G. R minus G is the real interest rate on government debt minus the uh, overall growth rate of the economy. And that's a measure of, of the fiscal resources needed to keep the debt to GDP ratio sustainable. And what you see is, uh, on the, on the left-hand side, is a measure of the unit cost of, uh, of, of servicing the debt. Uh, that's, the devi that's the difference between the real interest rate and the growth rate of the economy. Here I'm showing you averages for 33 OECD countries from 2012 to 2017. For all but five of these countries, that number is negative. That means that the cost of servicing the debt is, uh, is, is negative. The real interest rate on government debt falls below the growth rate of the economy. 
And if you take the left-hand side, the unit cost of servicing the public debt, and multiply it by the overall stock of debt, what you get is a measure of the cost, the overall cost to the economy of servicing the debt. And for, again, for, uh, for the vast majority of these countries, that number is negative. What that means is that governments are actually raising resources from, uh, raising fiscal resources from issuing government debt. There's no cost of, uh, there's no, uh, there's no cost in terms of real resources in servicing that debt. Now there are important outliers here, Portugal, Italy, Spain, all countries that face a substantial cost of servicing their debt. So what I'm gonna do, what I do in this paper is I think about, um, I, I, I think about a situation in which R can be less than G, the real interest rate can be lower than the growth rate of the economy, and in that situation, a fiscal authority might have uh, incentives to actually increase the level of debt because a higher level of debt will actually raise revenues. But that strategy could be risky. And the risk associated with that is that if real interest rates suddenly bounce back, if real interest rates uh, rise relative to the growth rate of the economy, that can impose sizable fiscal costs. And I sort of want to think about that trade-off in this paper. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring empirical evidence on the level and variability of this debt servicing cost, um, uh, bring, bring, bring to bear some um, empirical evidence on, uh, on these debt servicing costs. I'm going to provide some interest rate and debt servicing cost projections for the G7. And then I'm also going to turn to a quantitative model for the US to think specifically about what's the channel through which low productivity growth affects the cost of, of servicing the public debt. And some counterintuitive findings, I think, uh, come out in that, uh, from that model. All right, so just to fix ideas, where does this R minus G idea come from? Well, uh, the only equation, uh, well, I shouldn't say the only equation. The one equation I'll show you today is just the government's uh, budget constraint. On the left-hand side is the, uh, is the uh, is sources of funds. So uh, tax, sorry, taxes and uh, government debt are used to finance uh, government spending and to uh, pay interest on the government debt. In, 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 a, in a balanced growth path, in an economy that's growing, what this means is that the tax revenue, taxes as a share of GDP, have to cover government expenditures as a share of GDP, plus the cost of servicing the debt. And the cost of servicing the debt is this difference between the real interest rate on government debt and the growth rate of the economy. And if this number is negative, what that means is that as you increase the debt to GDP ratio, then, the, then for a given level of taxes, the government can spend more, or alternatively, for, uh, for a given level of government spending, the government has to, uh, has to tax less. And so what is the behavior of this object, R minus G, over a long period of time? So here I'm looking at data set, uh, a data set of 17 advanced economies uh, from 1870 to 2013. So over a very long period of time, I can ask the question, what's the real interest rate on government debt uh, relative to the growth rate of the economy? I take five-year averages of this, uh, of this variable to sort of smooth out the business cycle. And what you see is that for the median economy in this data set, the cost of servicing the government debt is close to zero. It's eight basis points. And this is not just for the US. This is for, this is for a broad set of countries. If you look at the post-war period, the cost of servicing the government debt uh, at the median is negative. For the US, it's even more negative. So in the post-war period, the cost of servicing the government debt is negative 135 basis points. Another way to think about this is just to look at the fraction of these five-year periods in which the cost of servicing the government debts is negative, and you can see that that's close to 50% of the time. For the US in the post-war period, 70% of these five-year periods were periods in which the cost uh, of servicing the debt was negative, and it's often very negative, less than negative 2%, uh, uh, some 30% some 30 of the time. Now, you might be saying, looking at that, well, then who cares about the level of government debt? Um, and if anything, a higher level of government debt will allow for uh, fiscal resources to be raised via government uh, debt rather than taxation. The one concern you would have there is that there is a substantial range in this, 
cost of servicing the debt. There's a five percentage point range from negative 2.5% to 2.2% to, uh, to for these 17 advanced countries. The range is a bit narrower for the U.S., but there's still a risk that the cost of servicing the government debt in any five-year period could be, uh, could be positive. So another limitation for governments looking to take advantage of the fact that R is less than G is that if you look at the periods in which GDP per capita growth is slow, I'm using that as a proxy for productivity growth, periods in which real GDP per capita growth, which is shown on the x-axis here, periods in which it is slow are associated in, with periods in which the cost of servicing the government debt is high. So it is precisely those times when productivity growth is slow that the cost of servicing the government debt goes up. There's, this is just a scatter plot from that, from that data set uh, earlier, but it, uh, but it shows up uh, pretty clearly. So that's one risk. If we're entering a period of slow productivity growth, then we should expect this to be a period in which the cost of servicing the government debt will be, uh, will be relatively higher. So how can we think more about this, this risk of reverting to a period in which the uh, cost of servicing the government debt uh, becomes positive? The way I formalize this is by running a set of probit regressions where I ask, what's the likelihood over the next five or 10 years that the cost of servicing the government debt turns positive? And so I run that probit regression uh, thinking about what's the current cost of servicing the government debt, what's the population growth rate, what's the debt to GDP ratio. Those are factors that we might think would have some influence on the probability of switching to a period in which R is greater than G. And what you find from, this, uh, from estimating this regression is that if, for example, I look at Canada, Canada currently has a negative cost of, serving its, uh, uh, of servicing the government debt. But over the next five years, the model would predict, this empirical model would predict a 40% probability of uh, entering a period of R greater than G in the next five years, and a nearly 50% probability uh, over the next 10 years. And you can see that those numbers are quite similar across the G7, that over the next five years, there's some 40% probability of switching to a positive cost of servicing the government debt. Over the next 10 years, it approaches 50%. And what would be the consequence of this? Well, the consequence of this could be a quite large change in the cost of servicing the debt. So this column here gives you the debt to GDP ratio. This column is the current level of R minus G, which is negative for all countries except Italy. And if you multiply the two together, you get the cost, of, uh, the cost as a share of GDP in servicing the government debt. If you revert to conditions where R is greater than G, at the median, that would mean that R minus G turns to 1.55%. That implies nearly a two percentage point swing in the cost of servicing the government debt, which is a pretty substantial swing in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of the fiscal consolidation required to keep the debt to GDP ratio constant. And you can see that this is magnified with the level of the debt to GDP ratio. So for Japan, which has a 200% debt to GDP ratio, this swing can be quite large, from negative 3% to positive 3%. You get a big change in the cost of servicing the government debt. So one might object to this analysis uh, on the basis that, do we think that this is sort of a realistic level of R minus G over the next five or 10 years, given the current uh, configuration of R minus G? So another approach I take is I estimate real interest rates over the subsequent uh, decade using, um, using a statistical model. Because real interest rates are non-stationary, I have to use um, a vector error correction model. But the point here is that uh, this model will expect real interest rates to rise in Canada and France. Real interest rates would uh, actually fall or stay the same in Germany, Japan, and Italy and would rise a bit in uh, the UK or, and the US. If you, take, if you take GDP per capita growth rates from, uh, if you just use current GDP per capita growth rates, or if I use the downside scenario uh, that, uh, that, that Adam spoke about, in either case, what you find is that for most of these countries, the cost of servicing the government debt remains negative. The, only, the countries that stand out here are, are Italy, where, uh, where the cost of servicing the government debt remains, uh, remains positive. But even for a country like Japan, 
this, uh, this cost is expected to may remain quite, quite low. So, uh, so, so either way, using th th there is some moderate probability of reversion, but, um, but to the extent that, uh, that real interest rates are not expected to rise, uh, to rise too much, uh, this should leave most of these countries uh, outside the Eurozone in, uh, in decent shape. But it's worth emphasizing here that the uncertainty bands around these real interest rate projections are very, very large. And so, uh, and so you need to simultaneously think about, uh, about that risk. All right, so our, um, I want, so far what I've talked about is just a reduced form analysis of this object, R minus G. I want to think a little bit more about what um, basic macroeconomic theory would suggest about the relationship between productivity growth and the real interest rate. So in a closed economy, we can think of the real interest rate as being uh, influenced or affected by the productivity growth rate, the growth rate of the population, and possibly by the level of the debt to GDP ratio. So I'm going to take a quantitative life cycle model that, is, uh, that takes into account the life cycle motive of savings, and I'm going to calibrate it to the US and ask, what is the effect of productivity growth, slower productivity growth, on the cost of servicing the debt? And what is the, what is the effect of changes in the debt to GDP ratio? I'm going to calibrate this model to match key, key moments of the labor share, uh, investment to output ratio, et cetera. All the details are in the paper. I don't have, uh, I don't have the time here to go into, uh, into details. But two sort of counterintuitive findings emerge. I want you to focus on the dark blue line here. And what this dark blue line is showing you is that as productivity growth falls, under the baseline calibration of this model, what happens to the real interest rate? Well, the real interest rate falls more than one for one. And so if you go back to this equation, lower productivity growth has a direct effect on economic growth. So a lower G has a direct effect on, uh, on, on overall economic growth, but it has an indirect effect on the real interest rate. And if that effect on the real interest rate is strong enough, then what happens is that slower productivity growth actually makes the debt more sustainable. It increases fiscal resources because the effect on the real interest rate dominates the effect on the productivity growth rate. Now this, this result turns out to hinge very much on a parameter called the uh, intertemporal elasticity of substitution. With other estimates of this parameter, you can get the reverse result that lower productivity growth will actually, uh, will actually make debt sustainability worse. But it's important to note that there's an extensive economic literature that suggests, uh, uh, both macroeconomic and finance literature, that suggests that this, uh, this uh, parameter is less than one. And therefore, the case that we should be thinking about is a case where the real interest rate responds more than, uh, than the productivity growth rate. A second thing to, so, so you might be thinking again, going back to uh, how I started the presentation, in the US, we're currently in a scenario where the real interest rate is less than the growth rate of the economy. So does that mean that we can actually lower taxes by increasing the debt to GDP ratio? Well, the model actually suggests that that's not the case. And it's not the case because there's an indirect effect of the debt to GDP ratio on the real interest rate. So the debt to GDP ratio on the US is about uh, 0 0.7 in the model. And the tax minimizing level of the debt to GDP ratio from this model is actually lower. And the reason that's the case is that there's two effects that changes in the debt to GDP ratio have on the cost of servicing the debt. The first, the first uh, effect is that higher debt to GDP ratio will increase the fiscal resources when R is less than G. But there's a second effect that a change in the debt to GDP ratio also has an effect on the unit cost of servicing the debt. And what, this, what the quantitative model suggests is actually that that second effect dominates here, that a slower, debt to G, uh, a slower growth rate of uh, so, uh, a, a lower level of the debt to GDP ratio should actually uh, allow uh, for more uh, fiscal resources um, because of its effect on the real interest rate. The other thing to notice, though, is that in this, if you look at the, the y-axis here, uh, 
there's not a lot of variation in the amount of taxes required to, uh, to keep the debt to GDP ratio stable, but uh, relative to the variation in the debt to GDP ratio on the x-axis. So this goes from a 40% debt to GDP ratio to 120% debt to GDP ratio. That's essentially the entire variation that you've seen since World War II. And it has, through, through the lens of the model, it has a very small effect on uh, the cost of servicing the debt. So those are two things that come out of, the, uh, that come out of this quantitative model. One last thing that I would like to talk about is uh, just what are the implications for small open economies? So far, the model has just talked about a closed economy and, and is just focused on the US. Uh, in a small open economy, almost by definition, the real interest rate is going to be disconnected from domestic fundamentals. So there's some domestic fundamentals in terms of productivity growth, in terms of population growth. The real interest rate that that, go that, that economy faces is going to be the world real interest rate. And that world real interest rate is going to be set by productivity growth uh, globally and population growth globally. What I find in the data is that there's a stronger common component in uh, real interest rates than in GDP growth. What that means is that uh, what matters for a small open economy is how does its productivity growth deviate from the global level of productivity growth. In particular, a small open economy can benefit when it has a relatively high uh, domestic TFP growth rate, but the global economy is otherwise has a very low uh, TFP growth rate. And the reason is, is again, through the interest rate channel. A low, low global productivity growth is going to depress the real interest rate that that small open economy faces and is going to benefit it from a debt sustainability perspective. There are other indirect channels that uh, one should take into account, the real exchange rate and possible financial stability issues. And I do find evidence that when US real rates are quite low, uh, the real exchange rate appreciates for these other economies, loan growth increases, house prices increase. So those are important channels that one might uh, want to take, uh, take into account that could eventually affect debt sustainability. All right, so I'm going to just leave, it, uh, leave you with a couple of key takeaways. On average, the cost of servicing the public debt is negative. Um, this servicing cost shows a lot of variability and a moderate likelihood of reversion in the medium term. By medium term, I mean five to 10 years. Um, Counterintuitively, slower productivity can benefit debt sustainability, debt sustainability by having a stronger effect on the real interest rate. And even though R is less than G for the US, it could be the case that the revenue maximizing level of debt is, uh, is lower. There are important limitations in my approach here. Um, R minus G is not a sufficient statistic for the optimal level of debt. And I've uh, abstracted here from any constraints due to the, due to the zero lower bound. But uh, we can talk about those things afterwards. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I get to talk about tax policy, which is, of course, a very timely topic these days. Um, so let's see. There you go. Uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to start uh, just with a couple of graphs of the data that have everyone so concerned. This is going to echo what um, Adam was saying earlier. Um, but basically, the motivation is the concern that the limited productivity growth of recent years will persist. Um, and I'm showing you labor productivity growth, not total factor productivity growth. That's what Adam was referring to in his opening remarks. But I'm showing you labor productivity growth through the United States on the left. And you can see their five-year trailing moving averages. You can see over the last five years, labor productivity growth has averaged about three quarters of a percent. And then on the right, I'm showing you the same for uh, the G7 countries. But really, uh, this is something that's going on in advanced countries, uh, certainly, and to some extent, other countries around the world. You can see that over the last five years, uh, labor productivity growth has also averaged around 3 quarters of a percent. Um, now, some of this is probably hangover from the great uh, recession, in particular, um, a result of the low rates of capital accumulation we saw in the early parts of this decade. But there are real concerns that um, there was a fundamental downshift in productivity growth in the early part of this uh, century. Um, and that's really what motivates uh, the project here. Um, 
So what this paper is going to do, I'm going to jump off the assumption that we're living in a lower productivity growth world, and that's going to have direct implications for how you want to change uh, tax systems. Um, but there are also going to be indirect implications that come through a bunch of other changes in the economy that come hand in hand with lower productivity growth. So I'm going to talk about how all of these considerations, um, uh, what the implications are for how we should adapt tax systems. Um, I'm going to use the different, it's a complicated question, so I'm going to use the different objectives of tax policy as an organizing principle. And um, before I get to any of that, I should note that um, I'm going to draw off this large related literature on how you want to reform tax systems to boost productivity growth. This is something that, of course, everyone is talking about these days. Um, but that's really, that's kind of a different topic. I mean, that's the question of, you know, things that you should be doing, you know, regardless of where productivity growth is now. Um, and I'm really talking about how do you adapt a tax system once you move to um, a lower productivity growth world. So... Um, Let's see, just in terms of the productivity assumptions, um, Adam ran through some of this, but basically in the baseline scenario, we're gonna assume that labor productivity growth and total factor productivity growth, they settle at an annual pace that's a few tenths of a percent below historical norms. Again, this is labor productivity growth, not the total factor productivity growth that uh, Adam was citing earlier, but for the United States, it's 1.8%. And in fact, a lot of um, that seems kind of discouraging that we're a few tenths below historical norms, uh, given some of the challenges that we're facing. But this is, in fact, where a lot of forecasters are these days. Um, we're also looking at a downside risk scenario where both labor productivity growth and total factor productivity growth are half a percentage point below the baseline. Um, so in the United States, that's like 1.2%, 1.3% for labor productivity growth. Um, I should note, this is not a far-fetched assumption. Um, I went back and I looked at uh, the survey of professional forecasters. They ask every January um, about people's expectations of productivity growth. And it turns out 25% of the sample thinks that um, productivity growth is going to be half a percentage point uh, below or more below the mean uh, answer for that question. So it's really not far-fetched. Um, so in terms of other factors that come hand in hand uh, with lower productivity growth, uh, the first one I wanna talk about is lower interest rates. Um, here, uh, you can look to theory for guidance. Uh, theory will tell you that when productivity growth declines, when growth declines, you'll see a decline in the real interest rate. Um, the exact theory tells you the exact relationship depends on preferences. So um, I've just put up the key equation from the Ramsey model here on this slide. Uh, and you can see that the relevant parameters are the time discount rate, uh, but then in particular, um, the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. Um, the less willing people are to substitute over time, the more interest rates are going to have to move in response to a change in growth. Um, so it, theory gives you some guidance. You have to choose your assumptions about preferences. Uh, but there's a nice paper uh, that was done by the Council of Economic Advisors when Jason was sharing a couple of years ago. It shows that reasonable parameter choices really do give you something like a one-for-one -one relationship in terms of how much the interest rate will decline when productivity growth declines. And um, you can see, if you look at um, forecasts, and I am sorry, the... Um, number of the second bars are not coming through, but imagine that there is, there are bars underneath those labels that say 2017. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but this again, this is turning to the United States for an example. Uh, and basically, CBO has lowered both R and G um, basically over the last five years in terms of their assumptions. They have lowered um, R um, a good bit more than they've lowered G, and that's not really having to do with their assumptions about uh, preferences, um, you know, related to the issue I was just talking about on the last slide. It more has to do with other um, kind of recognition of these other factors that are also weighing on R. Uh, so, you know, you have the aging population, you have higher income inequality, uh, you have some shorter term factors like uh, global monetary policy being expansionary. Um, but anyway, the point of the slide is just that we have seen uh, reductions in R, in fact, with people's uh, reductions in perceived G. 
Um, so that's uh, interest rates. Um, another uh, thing that should come hand in hand uh, with lower productivity growth is um, somewhat lower inflation. As I'll discuss uh, later on in the presentation, uh, having lower productivity growth and lower interest rates in particular is going to complicate monetary policy. It means you're going to be uh, butting up against the uh, effective lower bound uh, more frequently, and that's going to result in inflation that is more often below target. Um, it's going to result in a lower wage growth um, given, I mean, there is a relationship between productivity growth and wages, albeit an imperfect one. Uh, it may also result in flatter lifetime income paths, partly because the growth people see in, um, in, uh, in income over their lives has partly to do with how their productivity evolves, which has to do with their own human capital app uh, accumulation, but also with uh, kind of economy-wide productivity advances. Um, and then the last thing I just want to mention is that lower productivity growth is going to result in uh, less real bracket creep in the tax code. Um, so that is a term that you may not be familiar with, um, but it's uh, actually uh, something that's, that's pretty intuitive. Um, tax systems are largely indexed uh, for inflation. That's been true in this country since 1986. Um, nonetheless, uh, given real growth in income, you're going to see increases in both marginal and average tax rates over time. Um, so the real growth just subjects an ever larger portion of income to higher tax rates. Um, it also will um, push more taxpayers above the eligibility, eligibility limits for certain tax credits. So both um, those things um, will tend to increase tax rates over time. And if you have um, uh, slower productivity growth and you have lower wage growth, you're going to see less real bracket creep. And that has implications for revenues. And Louise is going to take that up when she does her paper. Um, but it also has implications for the exercise um, that I'm doing here. OK, so those are the various factors. Uh, let me turn that accompany uh, uh, lower productivity growth. Let me turn now to implications for the tax system. And um, what I want to just, the starting point is I just want to say we have these different objectives of tax systems. We use tax systems to collect revenues. We use tax systems to um, to incentivize work and saving. Uh, so we try to design them to minimize disincentives. Uh, we use tax systems to redistribute income. We use tax systems to mitigate business cycle fluctuations. And we use tax systems kind of more generally to minimize other sorts of distortions in resource allocation. So other ways in which the tax system uh, distorts uh, resource allocation or the failure to correct for externalities. And what I'm going to do, just as an organizing principle, is I'm going to just go through each one of these um, objectives in turn, and I'm going to think about how lower productivity growth um, bears on each of those objectives. And then we're going to think about how what that means for tax policy. OK. So uh, let's start with collecting revenues. Um, here, um, it's a the sort of Thinking about collecting revenues and revenues we're going to need to collect in the future, uh, there's uh, one huge factor which is um, has big implications for the amount of revenues that we need to collect in the future, and that is the aging populations we have around the world. Uh, this graph just shows you the population uh, 65 and older relative to the working age population. And I've shown it for sort of what I think of as kind of a representative sample of countries, all different types of countries. But you can see that these old age, I, don't know, I see, I guess I lost Brazil. But again, there's a line there for Brazil. Um, you can see that old age dependency ratios are really rising around the world. And um, basically what that means is that um, government social insurance programs that support the older population, both in terms of income and health care, um, basically expenditures from those programs are on track to really strain government budgets over time. And um, the basic story here is that a sustained period of low productivity growth would sharply worsen those budget challenges. So um, just uh, going to the United States as an example, and I'm sorry I lost a line on this chart as well, uh, but um, 
This is CBO's uh, projections, and uh, we can start with the baseline uh, scenario, which you can see on the chart, that um, even under the baseline scenario, which I told you is um, productivity growth that is a little bit below historical norms, um, and you're assuming these lower interest rates that come hand in hand with lower productivity growth, you can see that um, basically federal debt is projected to rise on unsustainable path, and um, you can't see the line because it's not on the, it fell off the chart, uh, but you can see where it ends up. It ends up at 173. Um, in the downside risk uh, scenario, um, the situation is, uh, or the deterioration in the budget situation is considerably worse. Um, so debt is going to rise uh, by 30% of GDP more. So, um, that's what you get, and um, the implications then for tax policy is that we're going to need a greater increase in taxes um, to pay the bills, okay? So that's a pretty easy story. Um, probably we're gonna have to reduce spending as well. Um, and I should say, CBO does build in um, a bunch of things that are going to happen, uh, including the lower interest rates, but they're actually not building in several things that may well happen if we're in a lower productivity growth world that would make the situation even worse. And I'm going to talk about um, these things later in the presentation, but basically if we need to increase national saving, if uh, lower productivity growth diminishes labor force participation, if it changes redistributive redistributional goals such that we want to do more federal spending, that will make the budget situation even worse. Okay, so that's collecting revenues. Uh, let me go now to um, uh, reducing disincentives for work. So um, lower wage growth is going to, or sorry, lower productivity growth should reduce future uh, wage growth and reduce future wages. Um, that's going to reduce the incentive of people to work in the future. Okay. There, to be sure, there's going to be an income effect as well, which could raise uh, the uh, motivation of people to work. But I should say uh, the last, the experience uh, in terms of the labor force participation rate of the last several decades certainly suggests that the substitution effect is a very powerful effect. So we need to worry that that's going to exacerbate the long-term decline in the labor force participation rate. And um, having high uh, participation, it's an important thing. Okay, so as I just said, it, uh, having high participation will reduce fiscal pressures because it means that uh, there'll be higher tax revenues, all else equal, and there's going to be less need for social insurance. Um, so uh, high participation is good in that way. It's good for people, too, because it increases uh, people's self-esteem, it increases their engagement with society, um, and I think these are things that um, we both should, uh, that we should uh, definitely be aiming for. Um, so um, this implies that tax incentives uh, sh for work should be increased in a lower productivity growth world. Um, again, you know, given the fiscal situation, of course, what you're doing with the tax system, you're going to want to target. So uh, in this case, I think you want your focus on groups that have the most elastic labor supply. So you want your focus on groups like second earners, um, making changes uh, such as increasing child care tax, child care subsidies in the tax system. Um, and you want your focus on groups that, um, uh, that you are most concerned about, like less skilled men, where we've seen a big decline in labor force participation rates. So, you know, expand the earned income tax credit. Um, so, uh, real bracket creep considerations means that we uh, need to do slightly less of the above than we would do otherwise um, because these incentives would erode more slowly over time. Okay, so uh, that's incentives for work. Let me turn now to incentives for saving. Um, so the first question I think you want to ask here is that if we're living in a lower productivity growth world, what does that mean in terms of national saving? And here the answer is um, it's ambiguous th theoretically. Uh, a standard Ramsey model finds that a change in G uh, has an ambiguous effect because there's a substitution effect, again, that argues for less saving because the rate of return is lower. Then there's an income effect that argues for more saving because future generations are worse off. So it's ambiguous, um, but you can go off and you can kind of try to 
uh, choose reasonable parameters. And uh, fortunately for me, Louise has actually already done that. She has a nice paper where she asks this question and sticks in reasonable parameters. And what they find is a small increase in optimal national saving. OK, so that's national saving. You also want to ask uh, you know, what the implications would be for saving at the household level, individual saving. And here, I think, I think here, I mean, again, uh, you can, there are income and substitution effects that, you know, may make the kind of logic, uh, you know, you have to kind of work it out. But here, I do think there is, again, um, a case for increasing uh, changes to the tax system that would increase individual saving. And that's both because of even the fiscal strains uh, because of the possibility of cuts in benefits for older, the older population uh, because of the fiscal strains. Um, and it's also um, the case that I think you want to motivate, maybe, maybe motivate people to start saving earlier in their lifetime because of the flatter lifetime earnings profile. Okay, so in terms of the implications for the tax system, I would say, you know, there's not a terribly compelling case for um, for using given for for using for changing the tax system to increase national saving that's both because of the theoretical ambiguity and when you stick in parameters it's a pretty small increase in the saving rate but also the tax system is such a blunt tool in terms of tax rates for changing national saving um, but I do think you want um, on the individual levels, more subsidies to encourage people to save and to start saving earlier. Um, so in particular, I think if you're aiming at the population, if you're most worried about the population that's doing almost no saving, I think what you want is more tax base breaks for firms to create kind of well-designed 401k plans. Okay, so let me move on now to redistributing income. Um, and here, uh, the issue is that you've got um, uh, kind of lower wage growth, and if you think about uh, you know shifting the whole uh, sh the whole distribution to the left, um, it's going to be harmful. Uh, it's going to be harmful to people um, first of all because people make fixed nominal commitments, um, and I should say that harm is exacerbated by the fact that you may get inflation being a little bit lower. So you have to pay your rent, you have to pay your uh, mortgage, and uh, with lower with more negative realizations of wage growth that's going to be um, harder for people. Um, I think uh, it can be frustrating because people have expectations that they're going to see rises in standards of living over time. So you could formalize that by making utility a function of consumption minus some benchmark for consumption, yesterday's consumption, for example. Um, and I think it's politically destructive because people expect a fair shot. So you might get more people uh, thinking the system is rigged. Um, so I think all of these things imply that lower productivity growth um, implies a greater ne need through, uh, for redistribution through the tax system. Um, and here I think um, there's several things you should do. We should probably make the tax system uh, more progressive generally. Uh, the tax system should provide uh, more insurance against bad outcomes. Uh, so, for example, we could have a real tax-based wage insurance program, uh, and we should raise tax subsidies for mechanisms that create opportunities. So more tax incentives, for example, for firms that provide training. Um, so that's uh, redistribution. Uh, let me go on to mitigating business cycle fluctuations. As I alluded to before, low productivity growth is going to lead to lower real interest rates, and that's going to complicate uh, central banks' ability to make uh, countercyclical policy um, because uh, they're only going to be able to lower the uh, policy rate by so much. And of course, we do have these alternative tools uh, for monetary policy, but there's been skepticism, skepticism uh, that's been growing and voiced in this very room several weeks ago about the ability of these alternative tools to basically uh, make up for the fact that you can't lower policy rates. So all of this is a way of saying that the countercyclical power of monetary policy is blunting with the implications for tax uh, policy uh, being that we need stronger uh, automatic stabilizers in the tax system. So the tax system will need to do more heavy lifting. Uh, in terms of automatic stabilizers, uh, there are different things to do. You could have automatic um, adjustments in the payroll tax rate when the unemployment rate crosses a given threshold, um, for example. Okay, 
And then uh, this is the, the last of the objectives of tax systems. This is the one that I talked about before, that there are basically all of these um, distortions in the tax system uh, that mean that resource allocation isn't optimal. Uh, so there's a very large literature on this already. The IMF has a nice summary paper that they did last spring. Jason's done a lot of uh, talking, particularly in recent weeks, on this topic. Um, so as I said before, these are things that we always should be trying to do with the tax system. Um, they're always important, but they're going to be especially important when productivity growth is weak. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm almost out of time. So uh, let me just, I'll throw up a sum summary slide just saying that I think the answer to the question of how you want to change tax policy uh, in response to lower productivity growth is you want to collect more revenue, you want to provide a greater incentive to work and maybe to save, you want your tax system to become more progressive, uh, you want it to offset business cycle downturns more vigorously, and you still want to work on improving resource allocation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss such an important topic. Uh, both papers that we heard today, are very, they're very insightful and thorough and very carefully thought through, and they, are, they address a very rich set of issues. What I'll do, what I'll do in my remarks today is, uh, given that these are some of the questions that we are thinking about in sovereign credit analysis on our side, I'm going to take a very practitioner angle at the topic and I'll sort of discuss how this relates to sovereign debt sustainability. So what I'll do is I'll motivate the topic putting my chief economist hat on for a second and then I'll walk through uh, several of the questions that are uh, really important in terms of thinking of what lower productivity growth means for sovereign debt sustainability. And then I'll come back and summarize kind of what a more positive view looks like about the impact of low productivity growth on sovereign debt sustainability, which is where Neil com uh, comes out. And then what a more negative view uh, looks like, uh, where I think more of, uh, Karen and I come out on, on that topic. Eh? All right. Okay. All right. So this is the picture's worth of a thousand word settings. I think that map really shows how important kind of the question is. So this is a map of the difference between the pre-crisis and post-crisis labor productivity growth across countries. And then what you see, the map is very, very red all across. So we're looking at a decline in productivity growth uh, across very, very broad-based globally. It's true for advanced economies, it's true for emerging uh, markets, it's true for about 80% of countries globally. The question of low productivity growth is especially important given the upcoming demographic trends. So the top charts on the, sheet, uh, on the, on the slide just shows the global real GDP growth and the fact that it's fallen after the crisis. The bottom uh, two charts more interestingly just uh, divide the contribution to growth from the growth in employment and the growth in labor productivity. So if you just look at the dotted uh, line on the employment chart, the global employment is projected to decline going forward very significantly. So the only way we get to any reasonable growth outcomes is if labor productivity recovers. The, I should say these are global, they're unweighted average across countries. They're intentionally unweighted, so we're not looking at uh, China and the US. But this trend holds for, again, about 75 to 80% of countries globally. And the last, the last uh, kind of point I'll make from the economist side is, in a world where we have been moving down potential growth forecasts, 
uh, to account for the slowdown in productivity growth. If you ask more people, most people's perception would be that current uh, potential growth forecasts already account for the slowdown in productivity growth. And the fact is that they account for some of it, but not all of it. So if you take the baseline, the top line of the chart is the baseline, and Moody's is pretty much in line with consensus at the moment for most countries. So that's what consensus is going to look like uh, as well. The, if, if productivity growth stays at the 2016 levels, that's the bottom blue, blue line on the chart. So we're looking at growth five years out at about one percentage point lower than where it, is, than where it would be otherwise. So there's still very, very significant downsize uh, risks with respect to, to growth forecasts and growth prospects. So with that, I'll come back to, to debt sustainability. And again, I'll, I'll sort of go through some of the kind of three sets of questions which arise on our side when we think about uh, the environment that we're in and what low productivity growth means for, for debt sustainability and for, for our sovereign uh, credit analysis. The, there's sort of three, if you look historically, there are three, if, if you take the debt sustainability analysis, the buildup in debt comes from three sources. So we have the primary deficit, you have the, the cash flow adjust, adjustment, which is typically materialization of contingent liabilities of some sort, and then the interest rate growth differential. Now, historically, the larger buildups of debt have typically occurred because of the first two. It's either the primary deficit or the materialization of contingent liabilities. So the chart just has the, the breakdown of the increasing debt for the US and Japan. The big green bar in the middle is the primary deficit. So most of the debt buildup has actually come from the, from the primary uh, deficit. And then that contribution has tended to be larger than what the interest rate growth differential has done. The, in terms of the, the materialization, the materialization of contingent liabilities is the other component that leads to kind of large buildups of debt. If you take, if you try to quantify what that might look like uh, across countries, if you take a, a cross country and a cross time average, the annual average uh, increase in debt that comes from contingent liabilities materialization is 4%, 4 percentage points of GDP. So it's very, very large, and it's most, the biggest, usually the biggest uh, kind of source to, of risk to sovereign balance sheets have been financial sector crisis. So the financial sector crisis have been kind of the most frequent occurrence and the largest fiscal cost associated with them in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, materialization of contingent liabilities. So the question becomes, what will low productivity growth mean for the materialization of contingent liabilities? And if you think in a world where, if you think in a world where the lower growth is generally negative for bank revenue growth, and lower interest rates are generally negative for bank profitability growth, then what does that imply for the probability of banking sector crisis? Essentially, all else equal. Uh, the second set of questions I'm going to open, and that's, that gets more controversial, is the, <laughs> we, what is really a sustainable level of debt? So if you look at the historically sovereign defaults have occurred at a very large uh, range of debt levels. They have occurred at very high debt to GDP levels, but they've also occurred at very low debt to GDP levels. So the historical experience uh, is not much of a guide to what is a sustainable debt level. So in a world where we have this historically high debt levels with the historically low interest rates, how, kind of, how relevant the traditional debt thresholds? So for example, the IMF uses this 90% and 60% debt to GDP thresholds for advanced and emerging markets. And the question is, in today's world, and given that that's the world we're going to live in for, for a while going forward, how relevant are these thresholds? Should we be thinking about moving all thresholds, all thresholds up? Given, given the low interest rate. The, and this is especially one, one more aspect which complicates the picture here is we are also in the world of QE. So for some of the big economies, you have increasing amount of uh, government debt being held by the central banks. Japan is the extreme example. So as of Q1 2017, the Bank of Japan holds 40% of, of JGBs. So the, the amount of debt, if you see the green part is the debt which is in private hands, and then the blue part on the chart is the debt which is held by the, by the central bank. Uh, 
So when we think about kind of traditional sovereign credit analysis and we think about fiscal space, should we be putting more, the question really becomes, should we be putting more weight on the combined fiscal space of government plus central bank rather than the traditional sovereign debt sustainability analysis which, only, which focuses on the fiscal space of the treasury? And then the third, the, the third question arises around, and Karen picked up some, some of that, is the demographics. So we're looking at unprecedented demographic transition over the next two decades and below. So just one example, in the US, the old age dependency ratio will double by 2050. And the demographic shifts will, one, further dampen productivity growth, but two, will independently put pressure on primary deficits uh, because of the increase in healthcare and pension spending they apply. So I'll spare you the, this is the, if you project out the US healthcare and pension expenditure under current policy, depending on what cost assumptions you get, this you get this very kind of scary scenarios, but uh, I'll, I'll spare you details on that, but the point is you get to very scary scenarios very easily. And that's true for the US and it's true for a whole lot of uh, advanced countries as well. So just to come back to what it all means, if you'd summarize kind of a more optimistic view on debt sustainability in a low productivity, low interest rate world going forward, and I think kind of Neil sort of falls in, in that, in that uh, camp a little bit, the, the, but the arguments would go something like that. So R is lower than G in many advanced economies. And I think we are in agreement there. I think if I look at our uh, forecasts for kind of rates and, and growth, uh, I think we would agree. We are looking at a few years out where the interest rate growth differential will be helpful for that sustainability for the for a number of the, the advanced economies and some of the emerging markets as well. So even where R is bigger than G, the productivity slowdown will reduce the differential by pushing down R relative to G. So in small open economies, domestic R is closely linked to the world are because of capital mobility, whereas uh, domestic growth is much less linked to, to global growth. So going forward, if uh, the interest rate growth differential uh, helps that sustainability and is likely to persist for most advanced countries, except for some euro area economies, uh, then that is on a sustainable trajectory, regardless of the debt to GDP ratio. And furthermore, uh, our low well interest rate will also continue to help countries with uh, autonomous growth rates. So then you can add one of my arguments to, to this view as well. In a world where central banks are holding big amounts of government debt, that essentially reduces the role of risk associated with government debt. So we should be, it, should be, it provides for the support to, to debt sustainability. Now on the Flip side, kind of a more pessimistic view on debt sustainability would go something like that. So low productivity growth would actually have a negative effect on sovereign debt sustainability. Uh, so reason one, the kind of a helpful interest rate growth differential is not enough to ensure debt sustainability. Historically, the most important threats to debt sustainability have come from either increase in the primary deficit, in the primary deficit or in materialization of contingent liabilities. Uh, both of which become more likely with lower productivity growth, and Karen picked up the tax uh, revenue piece of the of the puzzle there. Further, even in countries where the interest rate is less than the growth rate, there is a risk of reversion, and news estimates show that the risk of reversion is actually quite high. The for the in many emerging and frontier markets, R is actually bigger than G. Brazil and, and Russia would be examples of that here currently. And then the arm energy differential also may not decline as the productivity slowdown is global. Uh, it's not just in advanced countries. So you'd have kind of world interest rate pushing down the domestic interest rate, but at the same time, because of low productivity in, in, in uh, emerging markets as well, you could get independent push down on the domestic growth rate. So you might not get the difference between the two. It's not clear that it's going to be actually positive. And then additionally, we have this unprecedented demographic transition, which will exacerbate the decline in productivity growth and will also pressure uh, primary budget deficits. 
So I'm going to leave it here. I'm sure I opened a whole bunch of controversial questions, but <laughs> this is this is where it is. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we've been treated to a, a, a very stimulating and lucid uh, set of presentations. Um, let me start the questioning with uh, some observations on particularly Neil's paper. I mean, I think the, 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 the key point, actually, in both papers is that the, the classic contest between the interest rate and the growth rate really is a, a crucial driver. Uh, I was surprised n neither of the papers had the, the core formula in this, which is that primary surplus on the left-hand side of the percent of GDP has to equal the ratio of debt to GDP multiplied by the difference between the interest rate and the growth rate um, on the right-hand side. And that reminds us that the primary surplus is very important, uh, which Elena was emphasizing. It also reminds us that uh, where you start it makes a uh, a difference. Uh, let me raise one quibble sorry, about um, the formulation that, um, or the language that, that Neil uses. I, I don't think it makes any sense at all to say that there's a negative cost of debt unless the R star is minus, is less than zero. We had negative cost of debt um, when we had high inflation and there was a lag in interest rates, but uh, the the fact I, I would use language something like uh, burden alleviating or something like that. But maybe the the uh, editors can can deal with that. I think the core question is how confident can we be that the derivative of the interest rate with respect to the um, to the productivity growth um, seems to be about one. I guess you were suggesting, Karen, that, that, that there was some work at CEA that had come up with that. I mean, as I just look at the numbers from the, the productivity growth that uh, Fernald uh, established or, or, or identified, basically you've got productivity growth as he measures one and a half percent sort of from 1973 to 2014, with the exception of 1996 to 2003 when it's 3 percent. Okay, well, so we've got basically normal productivity growth, and this is total economy. I think Karen's talking about business economy, so you're leaving out, it's getting slightly different. If, if the benchmarks are 1.5 percent sort of business as, as usual, uh, when it jumped to 3 percent in the 90s, we had an absolute no change in the real interest rate. So this should make you a little suspicious of this uh, derivative of, of, of unity, uh, or, or at least a very uh, sizable positive derivative of, of the real interest rate with respect to uh, productivity growth. And, and I think it is particularly insofar as this is derived from uh, long-run models which are premised on the proposition that if you're going to grow slower, then everybody's going to be, going to be you know, responsible, and they're going to save more because they're not going to be as rich in the future. Anyway. I think that is a, um, uh, the, the, I would be interested in any reactions that um, the panel has to those comments before I open it up, and Neil particularly. So uh, on the question of the response of the real interest rate to, uh, to changes in productivity growth, you're right that the standard macroeconomic models we work with have a very close connection between the two. And that in the data, that connection seems uh, seems far less, uh, far more tenuous. Um, there's a recent work by um, uh, Jim Hamilton and um, and Jan Hatzius and co-authors that argues that actually, if you look in the in the U.S., there seems to be a very tenuous relationship between uh, their measures of productivity growth and and real interest rates over over a long period of time. 
Now, the standard answer is that in our, in our models, there's probably other things going on. And uh, it's worth sort of thinking about what's the channel through which productivity growth affects the real interest rate in our models. So the way it works is that um, the, the way the real interest rate is, is priced is through households' expectations of consumption growth. And um, if households uh, become more uh, pessimistic about their consumption growth, then, uh, then the real interest rate falls. The channel through which productivity affects the real interest rate then is that slower productivity growth eventually leads to slower consumption growth, which leads to, to, to lower real interest rates. But here, the, the key is the beliefs of, of households, how optimistic or pessimistic they are. And those things don't necessarily need to track uh, a productivity growth all that well, although you would expect that over time uh, they, um, uh, they, they would. So I think that... Um, uh, I think that that's a that the that's a that the that's a fair critique. Um, I also think that you know uh, what I showed for R minus G, there was no assumptions there about relationships between productivity growth and the real interest rate. Um, all those averages are just unconditional averages of how the government real interest rate looks relative to the growth rate of the economy. Okay, um, Karen, do you want to come in? Um, I mean, I mostly agree with what Neil said. I mean, it probably is, I agree that the in the data, the relationship is far from perfect. It's very, very un imperfect. Um, but it probably is the result of other things going on. Um, I think, uh, I, I guess I think the takeaway then is that you might be worried uh, I mean, if you think about what the risks are around the interest rate, uh, if it um, does not fall as much as the growth, I mean, in recent years we have seen it fall even more than, or people's expectations of where the interest rate is going to be has fall, fallen even more than their expectations of growth. But uh, if you're worried about, um, you know, what if what if that's not right? What if the interest rate isn't, if there, it's other factors holding on the interest rates and the interest rate is going to, in fact, go back up, I think that just makes the whole situation much, much worse. Right, let me then just ask one more uh, question, uh, and this is mainly with respect to implications of Karen's paper, but also um, Elena's comments. It does seem to me that the, the, the uh, demographics raises the question of somehow means testing uh, social guarantees that are age specific. It's not particularly clear to me if, if we've got a real problem of financing Medicare uh, that you shouldn't have a higher uh, co-payment by people above a certain income threshold uh, on that kind of thing. I just I just wonder, uh, Karen's paper sort of assumed that the society was capable of recognizing that there's when there's not as much to go around, you've got to make things more redistributive, and somehow that doesn't seem to be the tenor of the times. Um, so uh, one might think in some of those, uh, uh, the guarantees that uh, I wonder what your thoughts would be on 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 sort of making more of the the the, the age uh, based guarantees uh, sort of means tested um, so you know there's a huge conversation around what you need to do to make these entitlement systems uh, sustainable and the answer is probably that you're gonna have to do a bunch of things yeah. because any single thing is just not big enough you could just see the size of these challenges I mean they're just immense um, but I think that yes I think that um, some form of means testing will be something that we're gonna need to turn to I mean just in terms of my own personal opinion I think that it's the, just the wrong direction to go in to try to put this um, on kind of uh, the lower income, people who've had lower lifetime incomes, and that's only been, my view in that regard has only been reinforced by the fact that uh, this group just has seen uh, stagnant uh, wages and um, in 
as, as Louise has pointed out, it's not just income inequality that's translated into inequality in terms of lifespans, for example. That, that group actually has not seen big increases in longevity between our generation and our parents, our parents' generation and our generation. So I think that um, that should lead uh, the social planner to the conclusion that one of the things that we're going to need to do is means testing. Great. Let's open it for questions. Uh, if you're toward the back, you can just go to the mic back there. If you're toward the front, we have a traveling mic. If you could state your name and affiliation, that would be helpful. Please. So you could definitely, yeah, you could have de definitely address this by lengthening maturity uh, and by, um, I mean, to the extent that you think real interest rates are low because inflation uh, is, is, is high or unexpected inflation is high, then obviously tips would not, uh, would not help you there. And, and there is some evidence that at least historically governments have been able to take advantage of um, nominal interest rates that move that move less than than with inflation, um, and that's not something that I that I that I broke down. But uh, I think that that would be that that certainly maturity uh, would would potentially be an answer. Uh, sorry, I, I was what I had in mind here was a was a security that fixed the real interest rate sure. at issuance, so it wasn't variable. It was a but it was a perpetual instrument with a real rate. Does that solve your reversal issue? Yeah, certainly does. Uh, the question is what would what would investors uh, uh, at what price would they 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 what price would they pay for that? And the second question I, is more really by way of, of, an obs, of a larger observation, but it seems that this discussion is light on the fiscal consequences of being in an era where we may be stuck at the zero bound a lot of the time. Uh, I know you and other, others have recognized that this issue exists, but then it has been parked and hasn't been thoroughly explored. It seems that if we're looking at you know, potentially the benefits of R being less than G, then we also need to think about what it means to be in a world where we might spend, say, 30% of the time at the zero bound with output below potential. Uh, but also potentially in a way that through a variety of hysteresis type effects and under, under accumulation of capital stock could also end up perpetuating or amplifying your low uh, potential growth over longer periods of time. So have any of you given any sort of more detailed thought to how we could integrate uh, that idea of you know, longer periods, more frequent periods of the zero bound and their implications for public finances? I think Karen's paper maybe uh, addresses that. Would you like to start, Karen? Um, so that's a very good point, Krishna. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I talked, I touched on the issue of being spending more time at the affected lower bound, but um, I, what I did not do is I did not trace through the fiscal consequences. And I presume you're talking about the fact that if we're in an economy that's below potential, that's going to mean kind of more at a minimum, more automatic stabilizers and just more spending to, um, more countercyclical spending. So, um, yeah, I mean, I said we'd need to do more fiscally and that the uh, fiscal policy would, tax policy would need to do more of the heavy lifting, but that's going to have fiscal consequences. Thank you. Good point. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that uh, as well. I, I mean, the, the thing to remember, of course, is that the, the Federal Reserve is free to, of course, try to raise its inflation target and then decouple these, these, uh, these issues of, of low real rates and, uh, and the zero lower bound. Uh, but they, of course, seem uh, unwilling to do that, as do many central banks. So, uh, and, and, you know, there's the, the practical question of, I think they're unwilling to do that because they're not quite sure if they can uh, get uh, to, to a higher rate of inflation and they don't want to. I mean, promise something they can't deliver. If I can but. just follow up on Neil's, I, I, I think that would help, but I think 
you know, they've ra they've lowered the policy rate five percentage points in each of the last downturn, and raising the target by a couple percentage point will help, but it does not get you out of the woods on this issue. You can raise it more. <laughs> but, uh. So while we're waiting for the next question, let me ask about the sovereign risk connection here. I mean, we've got this chart that has the d U.S. debt to GDP ratio just shooting through the sky, and yet the model basically has sovereign risk for the U.S. at zero. Uh, if you, now, now maybe Neil, you, because you had some optimal uh, tax rate, maybe you were somehow taking that into account, but it'd be interesting, I mean, the Moody's perspective almost goes the opposite extreme because we've, we're gonna based on, you know, when last time that Argentina defaulted, we're gonna look at them and, you know, so there's probably a difference between the sovereign spread as a function and especially, especially with Japan, but. It, Maybe, Neil and, and Karen, you could comment a little bit more on what happens if people really start to worry about the, uh, well, after all, we do have a, a, a president who talked a lot about uh, great success in restructuring debt. So what happens if uh, people start to worry a little bit about that? Start hoarding money? <laughs> I mean, so, that, you know, that's a sort of, uh, a glib answer, but I, I, I do think that for advanced economies, it's it's difficult to see much in the way of of, of sovereign default risk uh, for for outside the eurozone. So so when you control your your own monetary policy, um, you know at least at least historically with even fairly high debt to GDP ratios, you didn't see you, you don't see much in the way of of, of sovereign default uh, sovereign default risk. Perhaps that has to do with uh, explicit financial repression. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't include that in the uh, in the model because I have a, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't quite know how to think about it for for advanced economies. Certainly for emerging market economies, it's a, uh, it's an issue. Certainly for economies that are part of the eurozone, it's an issue. But I'm not sure um, how to think about it for the U.S. and and, and Japan. Which, I mean, I think the it's very widely held opinion that risk is not priced is priced currently. So, and I think it's it's you know we are seeing, and I think it's it's uh, it's there, and it's probably there for the various arguments of why kind of spreads are so low, and it have to do with liquidity, have to do with the global interest rate, and kind of liquidity management in advanced countries, but. We in a world where we're seeing, you know, issuers which are kind of CAA rated issuance spreads, which is historically low. We have Tajikistan just issued a bond at like seven percent spread. So it's very, very. <laughs> I think it's it's one of the puzzles of why why spreads are so low. And if you ask, uh, even if you ask the investors that actually buy the bonds, uh, most of them actually think that the spreads are too low. I think, why don't we take one question from the front before we go back? I'm sorry, were you done? Yeah, no, I was just going to add. On the oh. U.S., you know, from a credit perspective, I think the, again, as if I look at kind of our projections out, we are looking at a period where the interest rate growth differential will be positive. I think for the U.S., from a credit perspective, the one of the most, if not the most important kind of drive of the credit worthiness for the U.S. will be the entitlement spending reform and where that goes. Because if you look at the debt trajectory, what really balloons the debt trajectory going out is essentially entitlement spending. Yes, yeah, so the rating agencies do affect. We have um, right up, up front here. Uh, hi, Robert Ziff with Ziff Brothers Investments. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the things that's striking is the extent to which the relationship between RNG has changed and with really the collapse of R. And one of the things I'm wondering is, you, know, you look at a world where people are buying debt at 3% for 30 years. And if you believe in a world of 1.8% productivity growth, that's something out of the monster raving loony party. Uh, and so I'm wondering, May it, what is your reaction to the thought that the bond market 
is expecting a substantially lower R in the future as the, <clears throat> excuse me, as the ability to uh, reduce unemployment goes away and as, uh, you know, you have to have very low rates of R to make any sense out of investing in a 30-year bond at 3%. Takers? Yes, but I think if you think of kind of what would make, if you take the, if you, if you take the, you know, the Federal Reserve kind of forward guidance, the dot plot, and if you take the, where market-based measures are of, of rates, there's a big disconnect, there's still a big disconnect, and kind of as the Fed has moved up in rates, the markets have kind of moved up a little bit, but there's still a big gap. So the only way to, Kind of one way to think through what explains where markets are is essentially would be an expectation of very low inflation, very low R going forward. I mean, I, I guess just what I, um, the perspective I would I would take this is just looking at the historical record. I think it was quite it's quite striking how low real interest rates are on government debt generally, and so. Uh, so, so the measure I was using here was is is a long-term government debt measure, uh, nominal interest rate less three-year moving average of inflation, and yeah, the real rate on this thing is is just is just quite low, and so um, so I'm not sure that that a three percent rate is is um, is abnormal. Uh, I mean, it is abnormal relative to the 1980s, but the 1980s was sort of the the, the one period in the in the post war period in the U S in which real rates were, were somewhat high. We had a question back there. Did you okay, Jason? So I had um, three questions. Am I allowed to have three or <laughs> okay, brief? Uh, the first question, Neil, with R minus G, you're using R as the social rate of time preference. If we think that the world is risky in the future and in a bad state, we're gonna to have to raise taxes a lot and that'll be really unpleasant. And in a good state, we'll get to cut taxes, but no one will care because they'll be so rich anyway. Should we think that R should be more like the risky rate of return and then some of the R minus G logic changes is a question for you. Question for all of anyone who wants to take it is if we think about policies that would affect the economy the delta R and the delta G from some policy undertaken in the United States, should I think of that in the same way that you're all thinking about the general relationship between R and G? So we do productivity or business tax reform or trade and it adds to growth or it subtracts to growth. How do we think of that translating into interest rates if the policy is here in the United States? Um, and then the third, which is sort of unfair, but Karen, if you wanna tell us something that you wouldn't have thought about the tax system, um, other than this low productivity world, but you completely changed your mind because of the low productivity world, as opposed to things you might have possibly liked anyway. So question one is for Neil. So, so you're right that, that, that what I'm thinking about, what I'm looking at here is just a, is a safe rate of return that you would expect to be, uh, to move around with risk premia and, and in general, uh, there's some positive risk premia. So, um, the 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 return on capital is going to be in general higher than the than the return on on, on government debt. Um, from the standpoint of debt sustainability, though, I think I think the thing that matters is just the effective interest rate on on, on government debt. And so, um, you can be in a world in which um, in which the return on on private investments is is uh, is higher due to due to the presence of risk premia or even changes in the risk premia. I don't know that it's relevant for for um, for thinking about um, you know debt sustainability. It's it's going to just come down to to whatever the government can can get away with in terms of uh, in term, in terms of its effective uh, uh, effective interest rate, real interest rate. Second question, and let's let Karen take the lead. And she can also answer the one specifically to her. Can I, can I get it? I was, can I? Oh, you want to come in on that? Okay, sure. I was going to come in on the third question, but. Okay. Can I do that? Uh, well, <laughs> since your, you your paper was sort of about, I mean, maybe we should give Neil the opportunity to see what he would have done in that section of your paper. 
Uh, what, what can you do if you're in, in Washington making policy to put a, a minus sign on delta R and to put a plus sign on delta G? That was your, that was your question, wasn't it? We might we might start, for example, with cutting the corporate tax from thirty five percent to twenty percent. How does that affect our? Um, I mean, I think it does matter. I mean, obviously, a, um, for example, something that only boosts growth in the short run is going to have a different effect on R than something that is, you know, a change in longer run growth. So, I, I, I'm not sure I can be more specific than that, but I think it, I think it does matter, and I think. One should not make that simplification. I mean, I think I think the effects here are, are all in the short run and and uh, and could potentially be quite different. But I, I I it is very difficult to think of any government policy that is going to boost the growth rate of productivity, and boost the level of productivity for some period of time. Uh, I'm you can pick your favorite policy, infrastructure, corporate taxes, whatever. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think there's a good reason to think that it's going to affect the growth rate of of productivity in the U.S., and therefore, I don't think it's going to have probably a long-run effect on the real interest rate as well. But, you know, in the long run, we're all dead, and so, and so the, the, the short-run effects are, 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 are probably quite important and, and would be interesting to think more about. So the third question before we go to the next question from the floor. Yeah, so I think the point you're making is aren't these things we want to do anyway? Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's, I, that's the way I conclude the paper, which is like, you know, of course we don't know if we're in this, this world that uh, Robert Ziff has been warning about, warning us about for a long time, but, you know, so many of these things you probably want to do them anyway. We already have, uh, we're already, we already have challenges related to the, if the zero lower bound. We already have uh, falling labor force participation rates. We already have even under pretty good assumptions about productivity, we're gonna have challenges in terms of the budget going forward and, uh, when it comes to the aging population. Um, you know, so I, I'm not really sh sure there is, um, th that I came away from the paper thinking, oh, here's something different you'd wanna do if we really were at one three, not one eight. On the other hand, doing the paper just made me realize how dire the situation is and, um, you know, we're having a whole conversation now about tax reform that you know may end up raising deficits and I know there's disagreement around it, but deficits and debt a bunch. And when you kind of think through an exercise like this, you're just thinking that seems kind of nuts because we need to be moving in the other direction. So. Okay, let's take uh, another question from the floor. And again, if you could identify yourself. Sarah Louise Shannon from Brookings. So question for Neil. So if we wanna look at the historical record to think about how risky these endeavors are, um, we look at, you looked at sort of what's the probability that it would revert. But we also look at long run averages where RNG were close to zero or negative, And this idea that somehow you'd have to raise taxes as opposed to just boring more for those periods before it reverted back, right? So it goes up, we, you know, we think if the historical record tells us it's gonna go back down. So is that really the right way to think about it? Why do we worry? I mean, unless we have some other story where at some point no one's gonna lend to us not just higher interest rates, but like there's a ceiling you know, on, on our debt to GDP ratio, why is that the right way to think about it? Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's a great question. I, um, I mean, I, I, I've been, labeled as the optimist on, uh, uh, in terms of government debt. I, I tried to frame the paper as that, that uh, on average, you can, uh, you, uh, the cost of servicing the debt is close to zero, uh, negative for the US, but you, you, you run the risk of these uh, interest rate reversals. Uh, I think that, I, I think looking at the historical record, you could say uh, that why not just in periods of, of high R, uh, run higher deficits and uh, and things will uh, will work out in the end. I mean, uh, Doug uh, Doug Elmendorf has a very nice paper on this and the deficit gamble. And so, uh, I I think that 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 view is not um, has 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 some merit. But uh, but 
our models also suggest that uh, that eventually there is some elasticity of the real interest rate to to uh, to, to high levels of debt, and so um, uh, that's worth um, that's worth thinking about. But I think it's a hard question. Yeah, there was a thing called Rubenomics, I believe. Yeah. There's one one it's kind of real life example. I don't know how the model is for that. <laughs> Shocks is really what triggers that reversal. So you have a Materialization of a shock, you have a jump in the debt ratio, and all of a sudden the spreads rise and your R minus G flips. So this is how it usually arises. I don't know how to go about modeling something like that. But. Sure, it just doesn't seem to happen for advanced economies. I mean, it definitely happens for emerging economies, and it seems to have happened for Eurozone economies that were uh, yoked to the Euro. Yeah. It just doesn't seem to happen in advanced economies. Yes. Question back here. Thank you. Uh, Vijay Mehta from Ziff Brothers Investments. Um, how would your conclusions change if uh, you take the assumption that a low productivity world might lead to higher inflation, not lower inflation? And I'm thinking of a stagflationary environment. You know, if you have a shift in an aggregate supply leading to increase in prices. Um, well, so I th think just off, I had not really thought about that, but um, the arguments that I made as to why you want to change tax policy because wage growth is lower when you have lower productivity growth. Um, so, so that was not when I was when I started down that road. I was thinking that's not not, not an entirely straightforward question. But uh, when it came down to it, it um, kind of a lot of my conclusions were based on the fact that there was something special about kind of negative uh, realizations of income uh, versus zero or positive realizations of income. So I think that. Uh, you know, for example, I talked about how if you have lower wage growth and you have more zeros or more negative realizations, it's going to be challenging because so many of the commitments people make or important commitments like rent or mortgages are fixed in nominal terms. But if you're in a higher inflation world, you don't have that concern, right? You're not getting the negatives. And I talked also about perceptions of um, kind of fairness and people uh, kind of thinking, oh, you know, I'm not doing well if I if I my standard of living isn't growing. Uh, you know, as to whether there could be some nominal illusion there, maybe. Um, I mean, on the other hand, you know, people, you know, hate high inflation. There is also this visceral reaction to high inflation that could be um, frustrating for people and uh, cause other frustrations of the political system. But I think um, I think you don't have that same problem where the I, I think there is like. I think the, the issue about the wage distributions shifting to the left, it does change when you have higher inflation. So uh, I, like most things, is uh, the effect is going to be ambiguous of, of if, if slow productivity growth is, uh, is inflationary. In the short run, you would expect, again, depending on, on uh, the maturity of the government debt, to, uh, that there would be a beneficial effect on the real interest rate. High inflation is going to push down the real interest rate. Uh, and that may dominate the direct effect on on economic uh, on economic growth. And if you look at the 1970s, this is what happened in the U.S. So, uh, 1970s were a time of very low real interest rates, and uh, and certainly slowing growth after uh, after the mid 1970s. And that continued to push down the debt to GDP ratio in the U.S. The U.S. debt to GDP ratio bottomed out in 1980 around 35 or 30 percent of uh, of GDP. And so that's an example of where, you know, where a sort of transition to a slow growth environment in, in and of itself uh, bode ill for, 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 for debt sustainability. But uh, in the longer run, the, 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 uh, the effects would depend on, on monetary policy and uh, how they responded to the. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I should say for my paper, too, that it, the zero low, it does change the zero low round sure. issues as well. But it does raise other complications for monetary policy. All right. Well, I think we have had a, an excellent session, and we can break now for coffee. Thank you.